Hello and welcome to Attacking Third. We're live on YouTube. Hello to all of you joining us in the chat. Thank you for all your patience. We appreciate you hanging out with us, getting ready to chat about all things She Believes Cup recap. Match day one is in the book, so make sure to subscribe to us, like this video, and drop us your thoughts on all things United States Women's National Team versus Canada in the chat. Hello and welcome to Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports, joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. We're going to recap Japan and Brazil, and we're going to recap the United States Women's National Team versus Canada. So make sure you leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Make sure you subscribe, download, follow anywhere you get Attacking Third on your favorite podcast platforms. Make sure you subscribe to YouTube. Let's chat about it. Lisa, I'm so happy you made it. We have to laugh about it. If we don't laugh, we'll cry at this point. Uh, Yes, everyone, thank you for being patient. Those that joined the the live, what, over an hour and a half ago. Um, I am so sorry. Out of my control. Flights get delayed. But I am home, and it's so good to be home. This is exactly what I want to be doing, recapping this game, talking about uh, the incredible competition that we saw between Brazil and Japan and then Canada and the demonstration in the United States. Um, it's it's definitely good to be home. First travel trip of 2023 for me, personal or business, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, like where I'm actually getting on a plane yeah. or a train and not just traveling like an hour. Yeah. I travel an hour like, you know, weekly, but this was like an actual trip. Um, and if it's any indication for the travel that is to come for 2023, woo, I am in for a doozy because plane delays, uh, tarmac <laughs> issues, mechanical issues. And then I land in Philly and it's pouring rain, but it's yeah. good to be home. And I am so, so excited to hear your thoughts, Sandra, because we haven't really chatted about the game yet. We were waiting right. for the live and waiting to talk about it. We wanted to keep we wanted to keep it as like authentic as we could in terms of like our reactions to things. And, you know, also, I knew you were going to be out in Orlando getting a bird's eye view, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, hosting things out there during the matches. Um, And I was just so excited for you because, you know, we we teased a lot about our. NWSL schedule drop shout out to our social team and dropping the tour type of theme and I love that your first trip of the year of course came with travel hiccups um but I love that you were able to 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 sort of scratch that and check that off uh the 2023 to-do list get a first flight in because you know we we linked up in Philly but that was yes. really snapped. And you're local there. So that doesn't exactly count. That counted for me, but not for you. It wasn't even a train ride. I just walked to that. <laughs> like, here I am. I'm just showing up to the draft. Um, but I was very, very excited for this one because I feel like you and I have had our eye on what I have dubbed the uh, February wild window. Uh, because so many things are going on during this particular uh, FIFA window. But that includes the She Believes Cup, and that is what we are here to chat about. Match day one kicks off with Japan versus Brazil, United States versus Canada. They were the headliners in this one. But let's chat about uh, this first game between uh, Japan and Brazil. In our preview, Lisa, we talked a little bit about what we could see out of this game. Uh, we made a, uh, some predictions. I had a draw. I was incorrect. I believe you went with Japan. You were incorrect. Yep. Love to come back. You all know we're, we're getting back into it in 2023. We love to come back on here and talk about how we were incorrect. Uh, 1-0 for the scoreline for Brazil. A late goal in this one. Uh, but I think we got to talk about the way in which it happened. And I'm really eager to share our thoughts on this game because, again, Lisa, you were there Mm -hmm. to take in this match in person. And I got a little bit of a different view because it's it's different when you're watching it live versus watching it remotely. So uh, I enjoyed watching these two teams go head to head. It was pretty evident early on in this game that we were going to see these two teams. It was going to be a try some stuff kind of game. Oh, Both yeah. Were interested in trying some attacking stuff uh, in, in this game. And it didn't leave a lot of room for 
uh, you know, defensive evaluation, but uh, I, I appreciated uh, some of the little bit of back and forth that we saw um, throughout the 90 minutes of this game. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this was one of the matches that even previewing the entirety of She Believes Cup, I was really excited to watch just the different styles of football between both of these sides. And the Japanese style of football is incredibly skilled and incredibly dynamic and to be able to watch this Japanese team do that against Brazil was very entertaining and despite Brazil getting the win and in, in one nil over this one and it was a, a late change and a, a late win for Brazil I think Japan moved the ball very well maybe even better than Brazil I think their off ball movement was really impressive to watch they had a lot of fluidity between their lines they had a lot of freedom uh, between the players and where they were able to move checking into the open spaces and I think at times it opened up a lot of holes in Brazil's defense, which allowed for Japan to get on those quick counterattacks. I mean, that's what we saw in the first half. It was, um, uh, I think, a lot of Japan at this point heading into the 45-minute the mark. It was a couple of really good chances by Japan and Brazil defensively holding on pretty tightly to the way this one um played out in the end of it all. I, I said this to you right before we went live and before we talked about this, because this game I did get to watch in person from the stadium. And in all honesty, I don't watch a lot of games in person. Um, I watch a lot of them on a screen. I call a lot of games on screens and on monitors. And it's very different um, to watch a game in person. It's just like the vantage point you're viewing, what you get to see. And although this game was very fast paced and very back and forth, it felt very unorganized and like discombob discombobulated during the run of play because it, it wasn't a lot of like fluidity. And, and I think it was a little bit sloppy on the defensive end for both sides because of how much freedom they gave their opponents, whether it was Brazil or Japan, to quickly transition and quickly move down the field. It was like the midfield had – no defense to it, which makes for a pretty fun game to watch yeah. apparently on TV, but in person as like a, an analytics person looking at this game tactically, I wanted to see a little bit more defense. I wanted to see hard tackles. I wanted to see a little bit more commitment to the buildup play and understanding the tactics of the game and breaking down your opponents and picking them apart. And I just didn't see that throughout this game, especially the first 45. It was just very open back and forth. You know, I think it's interesting to sort of hear you say that just because of, I guess, just sort of how this game closed out. It, I think, I guess if you're looking at it uh, in terms of the numbers, it's mostly even in, in terms of what we saw um, in, in terms of like the offensive side of, of the ball on both sides. Possession was nearly split with, with Japan at 51% compared to Brazil with 49%. But in terms of shots, it's 13 for Japan, nine on Brazil and Brazil kind of, the combo breaker there is the attempts on target with Brazil's five attempts on target versus one shot on goal mm -hmm. for Japan and watching it remotely, watching it on the stream, getting those different kind of angles. I mean, it, it, they had layers of it, like you said, like where there were stretches of time where you're just like, Oh, this is kind of entertaining and kind of, right. fun. but on the other side of that, maybe it's, you know, us, we're always desperate for looking at uh, defensive evaluations that we weren't necessarily seeing that right away in a game like this, which, yeah. which I think maybe it was pretty telling early on in that, in that second or that first half where we kind of saw Japan in a little bit of like a fluctuating three back um, going up against a Brazil side that was kind of trying to run and gun some things. So uh, I, I, the angles, I think for me that I was also really interested in looking at is, you know, we've got NWSL season right around the corner. We've been doing a lot of off season content, a lot of preseason content around that. So I was very interested in, um, getting some of those early preseason looks at, at, uh, some of the Brazilian players who yeah. are to NWSL clubs. And I think we got to see more defensive kind of responsibilities in that uh, in that second half. I'm in agreement with you there. Um, but I thought, you know, Caroline, I thought put in a pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Shape. I think she was kind of everywhere. It was really kind of cool to see such an attacking minded player like like her kind of really put in a. Uh, some coverage in terms of defensive pressing. Um, but I was really excited to see um, what Adriana could, could bring, uh, Julie Bianchi for uh, Orlando and the Red Stars now. So I think those were like some little interesting um, components, I think, that, that were kind of cool to come out of that first half. But I think when it comes to the second half, 
I think we just chucked everything out the window as soon as we saw <laughs> Marta li like warming up on the sideline, right? Sandra, it was you have no idea how loud oh. Exploria Stadium got. It First of all, any time she like screamed. stood up or like touched her hair, <laughs> that place went nuts because that's Marta's home, right? She's been yeah. at Orlando for so long. That's where she plays. That's where she's comfortable. Yeah, Marta starting to warm up. Um, many, many an eruption of noise. But I, I think Brazil changed a lot in the second half for the better. I think Brazil had the, the better of the second half between the two, and it has very little to do with the scoreline. I think that I mean, at the start of the second half, Brazil, they moved Dabinha from an out wider spot centrally, and, and they put her more in the middle of the pitch, which allowed her to receive the ball a lot more and have a lot more possession on top of it, which in turn allowed for Brazil to keep the ball much more and keep it higher up the pitch, not just have this really fast paced running gun offensive strike that they tried to have in the first half any chance they could because uh, Dabinia just allows for much more of that fluidity for the team. So I really like that tactical switch of putting Dabinia centrally, which we don't always see her like that centrally higher, that high up the pitch. I really liked it. Hey, Matt Potter at KC, you know, Take notes. I don't watching, know. Like watching the games, maybe like you watching that fodder. Um, I I liked it. It was really good to see. And then, uh, of course, as you just said, Marta being substituted into this match. And four minutes later, Brazil's on the board. Marta touches it like ten times, and there's already a Not goal. Even. I know. It took it took four minutes. Four minutes from her subbing into the game. I think she had three total touches it took mm -hmm. her three touches in this game to make an impact uh delivering yeah. this assist as the Binia slotted it away um and it just over fell i think at this point the 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 you're talking about an opening goal coming after like 70 plus minutes of play mm -hmm. and if you're talking about a goal coming that late in the game it might it might start it might feel like okay well that's the one that's the one that's going to determine things in this game especially when we're looking at Japan and and their attempts on target so few right um but that's what it sort of felt like and you could just sort of see the emotion of that moment as well like just obviously the, the crowd contributing to that but For sure. um, see what it meant to a player like Marta who had been absent for so, so long. And um, a player like the Binho, who's been also playing with her for, for a long time. Um, it's sort of it, having this game close out one zero with Brazil picking up all three points. I think it's set up an interesting scenario overall. For this cup As we knew that the United States versus Canada was going to happen next because it's only it's a round robin tournament. There's only going to be three games for each of the teams. So if you've got Brazil with all three points in first place now, what is that going to mean for the two teams uh, competing later on that day? So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about and pivot to the United States versus Canada now. Um, but before we actually get into this match, you yeah. changing the words on the screen. Thank you. At least oh, I was paying we, attention here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> before, before we get into actual match, I mean, we, if you're joining us, spoiler alert, we're going to spoil it for United States win, uh, two zero over Canada, but you know, we're going to maybe set the, set the scene a little bit for, mm -hmm. for this game. Um, because we talked about this in the preview, so we have to talk about it in the buildup now. Um, Canada soccer players um, in a year long dispute with their federation over multiple things. One of the biggest ones is, is pay inequity, but lack of resources and current budget cuts and in the months leading up to the world cup. And um while they were training and she believes so kind of a chaotic 72 hours to where they, the players said that they wanted to, to protest. They were going to boycott uh, strike the games. They were threatened with litigation by Canada soccer. And then things got scaled back. The players said we will play, but we will play in protest. Mm -hmm. um, United States women's national team uh, expressed um, support 
and solidarity uh, with Canada players who were going to play the game in protest. And there was that's where it was sort of that's where it stood when we um, had previewed this game. Uh, what was going to happen from that? What was uh, what was that going to look like? Because there was also media availability. Mm -hmm where U.S. players alluded to the fact that there was going to be a, a game day expression or demonstration of that solidarity. And as the hours led up to this game, we got to see more information come out about what all of the players were going to do uh, during the match. So Canada soccer players, they uh, put out a, a statement on their social media saying that they were going to wear purple, mm -hmm. um, purple as, um, as a symbol of protest and, and uh, fight for, for gender equality. Uh, and that's something that they're going to keep as part of their playing and protest. They're, we will continue to see the Canadian players as they participate um, and in any future events wearing some form of purple yeah purple chosen very specifically and very purposely for this cause because historically is this the, it said this in the statement historically purple has been associated with efforts of gender equality um so considering these current circumstances they're going to continue to wear purple um and and kind of go through with that and i think it's it's just another part of the story that the U.S. players also did this, not purple shirts, but purple wristbands, purple tape around their wrists, um, really in the name of gender equality, saying uh, U.S. players also coming out with a statement saying that they're supporting the Canadian women in this fight um, because they know it very well. They, they know it very well, this gender pay equality sport. And because of purple being um, – really encompassing gender equality across the board. Uh, the U.S. players also wrote in, they had white tape around their wrists and then wrote that was very legible to read. They put it out on their social medias. It said, defends trans joy. Um, so supporting trans rights in addition to supporting the Canadian women and their fight for equal pay. Yeah, I thought I thought it was very, uh, I thought it was very special. I thought it was very unique for both teams to um, sort of participate in this player demonstration, um, but also do things that were unique to to each of their teams. Like we, we saw the Canadian players walk out in the lead up to the anthem. Yes, in the, the purple and white wristbands, but also in purple shirts where it said enough is enough. And they participated in the anthem in unity. They were singing. They were proud to represent Canada, but had their shirts uh, also, you know, shown with the statement on them. And, um, yeah, we saw the, the white wristbands for uh, the United States Women's National Team, like you said, very, very legible um, in terms of all of the things that they were uh, demonstrating for appreciated that the players union went ahead and put out a statement to, to define what they were doing. I, I just want to read some of it here. It says at the start of the eighth, eighth edition of the, she believes cup our players are united in continuing to raise awareness on issues of equality. The USWNT players and Canadian players will wear both purple tape in the name of gender equality and white tape with defend trans joy. Given that this tournament was established to highlight gender equality, it will be the first time that the U.S. women's national team players will be treated as equals. While we thank U.S. soccer for their leadership, we know that it took courage from our U.S. WNT players to stand together, both in collective bargaining and through litigation. Although we were now on the other side of this fight and can focus our play on the fields, our counterparts in Canada and elsewhere are experiencing the same pervasive misogyny and unequal treatment that we faced. We stand with all women's footballers in calling attention to their collective fight, but also call on everyone to join and support the fight to eradicate all inequality and discrimination that exists in our sport. So we bring this up. And if you're joining us on our YouTube, you could see some of the images coming out of uh, the pregame ceremonies to start off just before kickoff. Um, and we, we bring all this up because something like this absolutely uh, impacts the players in the moment and on that pitch. Um, it's 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 emotional scenes. It's not an easy place to find yourself as a player 
playing in protest. It's not your, it's not an easy place to, to find yourself as the opposition, trying to be supportive and express solidarity in that, right? And then all of a sudden you have to say, okay, gloves off, let's 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 go at yeah. it. You know, it's a very, very unique set of circumstances um to to take a look at and sort of go through the motions of that before uh, kickoff because it oh, didn't there. while the anthems took place there was one more de player demonstration where all of the players came together in the center circle and locked arms and held a, a brief moment there um before the the first whistle um so listen. we've seen in the last 18 months in the last two years sandra we have seen so many powerful demonstrations peaceful um powerful statements from these players, whether it's in the NWSL or across women's international football or across even the men's team eventually, right? Like saying up and, and saying that they're going to support this as well. But these women, it's, it's in, inspiring, right? To see this and to have those players, both teams off the bench, uh, Canada and the United States linking arms at the center circle in a moment of silence to kind of bear witness to that in the stadium, to bear witness to what the fans around were, were saying and doing. And there's a lot of young girls, a lot of young soccer players that go to these games and look up to these idols of Alex Morgan and Rose Lavelle. And, and they idolize them and put them on a bit of a pedestal and to then have them go hand in hand with their opponents that they're about to play against and have to, look to their mom and say their dad or their parents say what's happening what's going on and their parents have to explain to them these women are fighting for equal pay and equal treatment that the men's team it it was powerful incredibly powerful and you talked about it the the emotional weight that this holds for these players the mental weight that this holds for these players in this moment when they also then have to 60 seconds later, go out and perform their job duties and play to their best of, the, of their abilities and play for a trophy and play for status and, and to play in front of fans and, and make them happy, right? This is the game of football that makes these players so happy. That's why they do it. And that's why the stadiums get filled up. And that's why you and I talk about it because yeah. it makes us happy. The game is happy and it's fun and it should be, but you have to balance those moments of uh, experience and fight it with the balance of playing and having fun and doing what you love. And it has been inspiring to watch these women do that over the last two years. It's, I was so eager to, to hear your thoughts on it because I know you, you were there and, um, there's something about being there when you witness mm -hmm. a moment like that. And you could see in the build up to the game, um, how little time, it takes for fans to um, get informed and be aware of what's happening, you know, in, in terms of uh, players and, and their demonstrations. And you could see like um, a lot of signage and support, like oh, with yeah. fans and for fans. And I thought that was very, very cool. Of all ages from young, young players and young fans to much older women that have fought their own battles of gender equality. So many signs that said, pay the Canadian women, equal women's rights, all of the things, trans rights, all of these gender equality posters and signs. And I think the message was very clear from both teams, from the fans, from everything. It was, it was very powerful. It does. Um, it's important to highlight because you have to, we knew that there was going to be a game of a 90 minute game of soccer that was played. And, and, and what was that going to look like as these two rosters went through player protests or uh, participated in uh, player demonstrations? Um, and maybe the, the way to start is taking a look at some of these starting 11s because those those are the players that are – the cameras are all on them, right, the, the, looking at the shirts or looking at the wristbands. So, you know, in terms of how players lined up in this match, uh, the United States had uh, Alyssa Nair start this game in net. Emily Fox, Alana Cook, Becky Sauber, and Crystal Dunn to round out the back line. Andy Sullivan, Ashley Sanchez, Lindsay Horan in the middle third, and Trinity Rodman, Alex Morgan, and Mallory Swanson for the starting 11. 
uh, in the front line there. Lisa, during our preview, we chatted a little bit about players that we wanted to see get the start. So, you know, for me, when I was taking a look at this starting 11, I liked that we got to see some of the players uh, that we had chatted about that we wanted to see get a start against Canada. So yeah, saw a listener. I talked about needing to see a little bit more from, from Alana Cook. I was hopeful that we could maybe see Gearman Cook, but one out of two ain't bad. We got to see Cook with the start at the at center back. And we knew that Rose Lavelle was going to yeah. be unavailable for this match uh, mm-hmm. due to some prior match day availability where uh, Black Olinowski and U.S. Soccer said that Rose Lavelle had picked up a, a small knock in training and there's a precaution they're keeping her out of match day one, but they hope to have her available for games two and three. So we were curious as to what we were going to see in the mix of this lineup from the midfield and through connecting through to that top line. So uh, when you saw this starting 11 drop, what were, what were some of your reactions? Rodman. (laughs) I was excited to see Trandy Rodman. I was, she, I think in, in, when you look back to the first trip of the year for this team going to New Zealand, we saw Rodman get a start starting nod in that second game, make an impact in the first game off the bench, get a start in the second game. And, and now to get a start in this opening game of, she believes I was really happy for her, really proud. Um, uh, Of course, as the game goes on, we learn that Trinity Rodman gets significant minutes in this game as well, which I, I was really happy to see it it doesn't help her because I I mean like that helps her, right? It's not going to hurt her to give her more time and do that. We've talked so much about the slow buildup for Rodman getting, making sure she's comfortable in the time, blah, blah, blah. No, throw her in. I want to see what she can do. And that's what we saw from black Leninovsky. Um, Yeah. As you mentioned with Lavelle being out and getting that injury, I, I assumed it would be a Sanchez swap, Ashley Sanchez in the midfield. And that's exactly what we saw. That's a like for like swap in my mind. Um, maybe not the experience or the specific talent, but the overall skill that they bring to the game, the type of player they are. Rose Lavelle and Ashley Sanchez, it's definitely a swap for swap. We did see Sullivan and Haran also in the midfield. And and I know we're going to talk about this, but much more defensive, much more flat between those two, looking like a double pivot. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. But um, had to throw that out there because I, I, I really, Haran was not much higher up the field than Sullivan the whole time. And then across the back line, I mean, I think Dunn and Fox on the outside backs is something that we could consistently see from Black Wenonofsky. I, I wanted to see Germa in the center back position I did. And I was sad not to see her at all during this game, but um, I, I don't know. That, that was one that I was like pretty sad to not see in there. And then of course the listener. Yeah. I, I listened. When I saw the, the starting lineup drop, I gave some of my thoughts already, but I liked it. I thought that this was a, a reasonable lineup, uh, all things considered players who were available versus players who were unavailable. Uh, I'm with you in, in sort of the United spirits, right? We got to see uh, a number of spirit players, whether it's Sullivan in, in the six or uh, Sanchez and Rodman getting t- tagged with the starts. I mean, when you see the starting 11 drops, you, you start to run through all these different scenarios in your head. Like, what are we going to see from, from player A, B, or C, and how are they going to combat against the opposition? What is that going yeah. to look like? So, uh, um, and of course, in the starting lineup, Alex Morgan, who was honored and celebrated for receiving 200 caps, she's just the 13th U.S. Women's National Team player to reach that milestone. And I think it's so fitting that she wears number 13 and she's the 13th player. There's a lot of yeah. uh, fun little things around that. And, and I think she did it right on November 13th in the game against Germany. There's a lot of cool things around that. But of course, she gets the start and I think very well deserved as well. Uh, not just something given yeah. to her because of the 200 caps and the honoring. I think very, very well deserved to have Morgan get the start. Did you see the boots? While you were watching it live, oh, the little two hundred cool. cap boots who was rocking uh rocking the captain's armband in, so in cool. this one. Um she definitely we'll we'll say that Alex Morgan definitely had an impact in this game and it was For more sure. than just the, the ceremony. You didn't see her her cleats by any chance. Go on social media, they're all over there. Super cool, super iconic for her. They're on attacking third social on our Instagram and our Instagram. Go check our Instagram and our Twitter, excuse me. Go check them out. Little two hundreds on on both of her cleats. I mean, what an accomplishment. Fantastic. Very cool. Absolutely. We're going to chat about some uh, player performances and break down uh, first half versus second half. So make sure you stick with us right after a quick break. 
we're really breaking through and we're opening doors for the next generation. If you see someone who looks like you doing things out of the ordinary, it would encourage you that you can do the same thing or better. Someone at some point might feel inspired just by the existence of these stories. You can't always do what you're told. Now we get to be in places of authority. Now I get to be a captain. Let's fly. All right, welcome back. Let's chat about the game a little bit. A 2-0 victory for the United States over the Canadian team. Um, look, first whistle, they got off to a quick start and they never looked back. I mean, that that's, oh, yeah. that's kind of the energy uh, that was around this entire 90 minutes. Um, yeah, we set the scene. We set the table. We discussed um, a lot of what took place prior to this game, the lead in the lead up to this game, uh, player demonstrations. I think it's uh, it was a difficult match, I think, to, to sort of get your your mind around. I think if you were the opposition and um, I think if you're if you're the host, in this case, the United States women's national team, you do your best to, to support your opposition in their play. Um, and then once that clock hit <laughs> the, the triple, the triple zero mark to, to get things going. Um, they didn't, they didn't look back. They said, okay, now it's soccer time, baby. Jeez, Louise, talk about a fast start for the U S uh, listen two really good looks in like the opening three minutes yeah. of the game. You had Swanson and uh, Sanchez forcing Kaylin Sheridan into making a couple of saves right in the opening three minutes that led into another attack uh, down towards the end line where they won their first corner of their game just as the the clock, I think, hit um, four minutes into the game. So it was, it was just uh, – it was pretty relentless – early on mm -hmm. for, for the United States uh, against uh, Canada. And um, look, in all fairness, I don't, I don't think that's disrespectful in any sense. Um, no. I think you're, you have two teams there that, that are trying to play a soccer game that are trying to compete. I mean, the Canadians right. said coming out of their player availability that they are motivated, that they want to go out and she believes cup and compete and try to lift that cup. Um, and uh, we saw the United States uh, kind of honor that and, and do similarly. Totally. Go after all three points. I think we saw the game plan for the United States, as you said, as soon as we saw triple zeros, as soon as the first whistle blew, the game plan for the U.S. was score early, score often, put pressure on. As soon as you lose the ball, went back immediately. Uh, I mean, the high press from the United States was one of the most organized that we have seen in a while, in a long time. And against a Canadian side that knows how to build out, build out of the back, knows how to break a press. And I think that's what made the counter press for the U.S. so impressive. Um, yeah, because I think the way that the United States started this game sets the tone for the year. And for, for what this team is looking to accomplish. And despite all of um, the pregame moment of silence and everything that this game stood for for Canada, I think the United States really came out. And I mean, I was impressed with how they started. And and again, I think it's no knock on Canada. I actually think I want to like give Canada a hug a little bit because how, how mentally exhausted must have those players have been. Not only were they traveling all week from all of North America, Europe, uh, getting to Orlando. Then they have to train with their national team, and those trainings aren't easy, and prepare for a She Believes Cup. Oh, and by the way, they're also in meetings constantly and all day just with their team, with their players' association, with their federation, Canada Soccer. Uh, that is mentally exhausting for those players. Yeah. Um, and and to try to make a stand and to be so public about it, I mean, I I just want to give them a hug right at this point, like as, as lame as that sounds. But I think they looked tired, too. They looked exhausted. And I don't blame them. No, that's not that's not lame at all. That's just like being a human being and, <laughs> and being kind and like a good person. I'm, I'm with you. Um, you always want to send best wishes to the players who are, are, are struggling through some uh, various levels of adversity. But I mean, my goodness, like seven minutes. It took seven minutes for the United States women's national team to put a real stamp on this game. Mallory Swanson from the from the jump uh, kind of. Mm -hmm. Reminding everyone that she is um, hitting a ridiculous 
form right now. I think if you're looking for the heat check, it belongs to Mallory Swanson right now in 2023, uh, getting things started with those early chances against uh, Sheridan and then getting the breakthrough uh, with a lovely little uh, link up Rodman to Morgan into the box and then Morgan with the half turn to be able to sort of lay this off to uh, to Swanson, who just nails it. And it is very, very quickly 1-0 to the United States. Uh, and it just, again, just <laughs> didn't look like they were going to slow down um, oh. in any capacity. And they, and they didn't. Yeah. I, I, I love, yeah, I love the way that they started this game. And, and honestly, the I think it's very important to note that all three of the forwards, Rodman and Morgan, and of course, Swanson, who scored the opening goal, were very involved in that play. And not just involved, uh, in, in like a small sense of the word, but opening up spaces, moving off the ball, getting touches on it, creating opportunities. I think that fluidity was really, really pretty to see. I, I think Ashley Sanchez as well started this game very well. And I'm not just talking about the incredible shot she had forcing Sheridan to, to make an incredible save, but the fact that she was able to make those overlapping runs so frequently and get into the the front line, overlapping Alex Morgan and, and occupy that space. There was just a lot of really good fluid movement between the front line and, and that midfield front player of Ashley Sanchez for this United States team. And, and I mean, you said it, Swanson is flying right now. Mallory Swanson is flying. It was incredible to watch her and, and kind of see how this game got off to that type of a quick start and especially for Swanson that's her fourth goal of 2023 and we are on February 16th at this point uh, it, in between their first goal and their second goal there's is a pretty big chunk of time I think in this first half considering all of the constant pressure that we were seeing from the United States uh Lindsay Horan with a really good opportunity at one point um her header just sort of nicking the the far post uh she's done that a few times I think in in some recent games so um that in itself is is kind of interesting but uh the second goal for this team Swanson providing once again, comes in the 34th minute. So it almost sort of feels like in these waves of attack mm -hmm. by the United States, as if any moment now, this game is going to absolutely get away from Canada. But it doesn't. It doesn't. I think considering uh, all of the dangerous scenarios that the United States was presenting to Canada, all of the constant time that they were spending, not just in their half, but in their final third, I think in the opening 50, 15 minutes of this game, mm -hmm. It was like the United States had some wild stat where the touch map was like 50 touches in the final third versus one to Canada, like just in the Holy cow. minutes. So it's you could just you could just definitely feel it. It it, it matched both the eye test and the the stat test uh, in terms of the feeling of the first 45. But this second goal. The second goal, Lisa, can you talk to me about maybe some of the enthusiasm and the buildup sort of in the arena uh, at this point on this second goal? I, I mean, I think Alex Morgan should get 99% of the credit for this second goal for the United States. I mean, this is the counter press that I was talking about, and it starts with the players in the front line. And, and we know Rodman can run for days. And um, I think that having her and Swanson on the, on the outsides to apply so much of that pressure really worked well. And honestly, I also think having Haran be a little bit deeper and filling in those gaps next to Andy Sullivan allowed for the freedom for our wingers, which would be Rodman and, and Swanson at this point to chase, to run down the ball. And that's what we see as uh, before the second goal happens. And it's Alex Morgan who pressures Vanessa Gilles, back line of Canada. Um, and, and, and that's what forces the errant pass. And because of that, I mean, that's, that was two errant passes from Canada, right? That that's where the United States did so well in their counter press and doing it so smart. And, and it was driven by Andy Sullivan and Lindsay Horan being that the double six dropping back flat. So it looked like a four, two, three, one defensive shape for the United States when they didn't have the ball. And that's what worked because Alex Morgan puts that top pressure on, which allows the speed and, and the ability to read errant passes from Rodman and Swanson to step in and intercept it. Um, and before you know it, Swanson's got two and the United States are on the board. And again, you think the U S is going to run away with this. 
watching watching Swanson just poach and just seeing how quickly she gets to this ball before Sheridan can even yeah. think about making the turn to go mm -hmm. after it uh, was quite impressive. But I want to touch on what you were chatting a little bit about Lindsay Horan and, and her playing this as well. So, so a lot, I'm hearing a lot about the dual sixes and I'm sorry, but for me, I thought it looked more just kind of like box to box eight, but for you, okay. watching it, for you watching it live, did it just sort, did it feel more just sort of like a dual six kind of energy? Uh, so that's very, very interesting. No, it didn't. It, it wasn't. They were not next to each other the whole game. They weren't double sixes yeah, that yeah. were that were on a rope. Lindsey Horan definitely had more freedom to push up higher and play the the role that we have traditionally seen Lindsey Horan play. In. However, as soon as the United States lost the ball, they were parallel to each other. Yeah. They were in communication about where the defensive space was, one pressuring, one holding the space in behind. And I think that's what made it so, so effective because we saw Ashley Sanchez running wild and it worked, right? That's what we would want from Rose Lavelle in that situation, running wherever she wants, making those overlapping runs, occupying the space, filling in the gaps, pressing wide if she needs. And because of that, it forced Lindsay Horan to be more aware of where Sanchez was at all mm -hmm. times and still understanding, hey, as soon as we lose, lose the ball, I've got to be right in line with Andy Sullivan and, and really drop into that defensive positioning. I, um, I'm with, listen, Whatever they want to label it, it looked great. I'll just be, I'll just, be, I'll just give you real. Um, uh, I loved this game out of Andy Sullivan. I think once we have the first half conclude, right? Yes. Canada sort of brings it on a little bit. They get a couple of good chances. They win a corner kick. They remind the United States, like, look, you're up two goals, but we're not going anywhere. Totally. Outstanding saves by Alyssa Nair. Halftime comes for me. Very quick halftime MVPs with Swanson, Andy Sullivan, and Alyssa Nair. I love I'm giving Emily Fox a shout too. I think Emily Fox did very well on the right side. She was in the attack. She it clearly Emily Fox can play on the left or the right. And she played right throughout college most of her time at UNC. So of course we knew she could do that, but she has just the amount of confidence and the speed and the physicality to get up and down the pitch fast as can be, quick as can be, and as smart as can be. I, I liked watching her. I love the energy. There's a moment where Nair's positioning uh, ensures that, again, there's no goal here. Uh, and you see the United States <laughs> quickly want to try to get back on, on the counter. And there's a moment here where Sullivan is on the ball and there is enough space to perhaps make a move, but she's, you know, she kind of plays into some contact and, and uh, an opposing press from, from Canada. And she's pissed. I love the energy. There's yeah. this moment here where she just roars out into the uniform, uh, the universe, because she's like, Oh, that was my ball to Gary and take. Yeah. You know I, mean? I just loved the energy uh, and whether it was, um, this sort of freedom that they were giving Haran in light of having Sullivan in play and starting the two of them, uh, how that contributed or the fact that it was the type of game or the type of opposition that it was, you know, a big CONCACAF rival in, in Canada. I thought it was great energy out of uh, Andy Sullivan. It, it just sort of was a type of game where it was like, please leave zero room for doubts that right. Andy Sullivan I is six this this was one of the best games we've seen the united states play in a very long time and mind you this was like without sophia smith in the front line as well without rose lavelle in the midfield i i was very impressed with this team and and what they put out there i agree i think andy sullivan said Hey, what's all this talk about Taylor Corniak playing this role? <laughs> Heck no, it's mine. And it's about time, Sullivan. Like, that's what we want to see. Own that position. I think her having Haran, knowing that she's going to have a little bit more support defensively from her midfield partner, maybe allowed Andy Sullivan to play with a little bit more freedom and flexibility in the attack when she did have the ball, to take a couple more risks and to be frustrated with herself when she doesn't carry the ball forward and, and those moments like that. It, sometimes it comes down to between the ears and, and what these players mentally are going through, the pressure that they put on themselves, yeah. the, the job they know that they have to do. And, and maybe that's what it came down to for a player like Sullivan. No, I, absolutely. I'm in agreement with you. I think, I think the second half, I, I wouldn't say that it leveled out, a bit, but there was there were definitely some moments of, of more broken broken up play uh, for the United States. Canada 
playing their way into things just a little bit, at the very least enough to sustain, I guess, what could be considered one of those traditional kind of narrow, respectable score lines uh, between the two. But we didn't really see uh, as active or as aggressive of, of a press from the United States, maybe in that second half. Mm-hmm. Um, as compared to the first, whether that was due specifically to uh, a coach's uh, tactical adjustment or otherwise, it just was a little bit different. But uh, still some moments of opportunity for this team. We did get to see uh, players get rotated in towards uh, that second half. We saw Emily Sonnet get more minutes. This is another one of these players who making her way back from injury um, came in for Crystal Dunn, who put in a 45 minutes ship and Emily Sonnet getting a 45 minute ship as well. We saw substitutions at the hour mark. We saw uh, Christy Mewis come on into the match. We saw Taylor Cornick, Lynn Williams, and Hatch also come into the second half as well. Ashley Hatch missing a really good opportunity here. Some good half turn hold to play by uh, Christy Mewis. And then this shot just lands directly to, to share it in when we're talking about the short buildup that remains to the world cup. Uh, and we're looking at players who perhaps are trying to leave that impact. Mm-hmm. There were a number of these players who came on as substitutions who are perhaps trying to make sure that they leave that impact on their coaching staff. Uh, you know, what did you think of the very limited minutes for like a, a corniac who only really came in with like, two minutes and stoppage time remaining. Yeah, not but much. Sonnet, a sonnet at the halftime or Mewis yeah. the match at the hour or even a Lynn Williams at the 78th minute. What, what were you thinking of the subs here? Yeah, I think really hard to judge anything that Korniak did at that point in time. Just not enough time for evaluation. Um, honestly, a shame that we didn't get to see a little bit more just of how much talk throughout the She Believes training camp has been about uh, – Korniak in that six role and, and kind of what she could do in the midfield and how she could maybe play alongside a Sullivan. I would have liked to see that a little bit more maybe in the next two games that we'll have for this team. Um, I, I think that I, I was a little disappointed in Ashley Hatch and what she brought to this second half game. As you mentioned, the United States weren't as high energy and high pressing in the second half as, as they were in the first half. And, and that's a tactical smart decision by Black Wadonofsky. Sit back, do more of a mid block and allow Canada to play it around in their back end of the field and their defensive end of the field and then look to win it back as soon as it comes into your end. I'm fine with that. That doesn't really play into the Ashley Hatch style of soccer, right? She wants to run. She wants to chase things down. And I just think with the the way the U.S. was playing in the second half when Hatch came in, I just wasn't as impressed with what she could do, um, uh, honestly. Like, uh, I didn't think that was her game. That's not to say anything about moving forward. I I think we've seen great things from Hatch. Um, I wanted to see more time from Lynn Williams. I think she brings such a spark. She can just run, and it's fun to watch her. It's really good to see that she's come back from this injury that set her back, and she's come back so strong from it. I, I like to see that. I, we got to see a couple of minutes from Midge Purse as well. Um, I think that's another player that could slot in there. And, and of course, Christy Mewis. I mean, this is a player that I feel like we don't get to see enough at the U.S. international level. But it, it's almost like the old faithful. Like, you know, you can throw in Christy and she'll play that role and she'll keep the ball for you. She's not going to change the world in that role, but – it's it's good to have her. So I'm glad she got minutes in this game because we just haven't seen her enough. So if if he's going to continue to give her 15 minutes every game, I'm okay with that at this point because I think that ahead of her is Sanchez, ahead of her is Rose Lavelle 100%, and ahead of her is Haran, and then Sullivan in the midfield. And it kind of looks like Taylor Korniak might also be one of those players that defensively would step in a little bit more. Honestly, I'm oh, Emily Sonnet. That was the other substitute that came in. Um, it was good to see her. I mean, Sonnet with the foot skills. Hello, Sonnet. She gets traded from Washington Spirit to OL Rain. Laura Harvey's what got her doing like foot skills drills day in and day out. She was like juking defenders, dribbling around them. So much confidence in the back end of the field and the attacking end. Um, I, Emily Sonnet impressed me. She made me smile watching her play. I'm going to be honest. She was smiling. Uh, yeah. It was, it was kind of it was funny. Fun. She, took, uh, she took some tough contact um, mm-hmm. <laughs> late, late in in, uh, in the game um, by Jenna Halsham, I believe. But it was sort of funny to watch the interaction between them. Um, but I think in, important to note, 
sort of the substitutions because this is a transition here, right? This is a round robin style tournament. There will be a quick turnaround uh, for all of the teams involved. The next match day is going to be on Sunday, February 19th. The United States is now going to face Japan. So we would anticipate that naturally there was likely to be some player rotation uh, from game one to game two. Um, something that we'll have to keep an eye on is whether or not Rose Lavelle is available for this match against Japan. But I would anticipate that perhaps some of these players that we saw in, in the second half might swap. Maybe these are some players who might get a start against uh, Japan versus coming in as impact players. Now, knowing what we saw out of Japan mm -hmm. against Brazil and seeing what we saw out of the United States against Canada, uh, what are some things that you're looking out uh, for, or looking for a USA to sort of bring into this game against Japan? For the United States, I, I want to see them start the exact same way they started against Canada. Fast. Put pressure on them. Get shots on goal in the opening five minutes if you can. Put Japan under pressure defensively. Do that. Uh, do the quick counter press. Um, make that attack really really work for to get the ball back be the first ones don't put your back line under pressure at all that's that's what I want to see from the United States to start this game um, in, in terms of personnel I think that we could see a very similar back line um, I, I want to see Gurma back in there but I think we'll still see Dunn and Fox on the outside really? no no Huerta for you I don't think she'll get the start all right interesting I don't yeah. um uh, this is game two of three, right? And, and you're going up against a, a Japanese side that just lost against Brazil. So Japan has a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. They need to come out and get points in this game against you. You're in Nashville. Um, I think that we could see a, something a little different from Japan. I mean, if, if I'm Japan, I'm looking back at that game against Brazil and I'm looking at that first half and saying, hey, what, where could we have capitalized on these moments where we had good chances, we had good shots, we put Brazil under pressure, we forced them to defend around us. And, and then how do we do that against the United States for a full 90 minutes? Because in the second half, Japan, they couldn't keep up with Brazil's tactical changes. Um, and, and I think with the United States, I think we could see a little bit of rotation in the front line. Um, mm -hmm. with who comes in. I will I want to see Lynn Williams get a start. Yeah. I I do. I it's really interesting. Do. And I'm with you. I'm with you on that a hundred percent. I'm also interested in in uh the minutes the minutes management uh off of her injury in this particular window because mm -hmm. we saw against New Zealand Lynn Williams was getting like 15 to 30 minute windows uh, against New Zealand and coming into this game against Canada at the 78th minute. So about 12 in, in stoppage time. Right. So I'm curious if, if uh, discussions around her return to play protocols include what expanded minutes may look like during a she believes cup i feel like a, a japanese team in this window could be a prime time lynn williams kind of game but yes. we'll, we'll see i, I, I just, want. yeah i i would love to see it too um especially considering we saw rodman get a right. star and extended minutes yeah I, I don't think we'll see that again. And it has nothing to do with how Rodman performed. I think she had a really good first half. I think second half was a little bit quieter for Rodman. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I still think that she proved herself. And I, I think that we could see Lynn Williams and Mitch Purse get starts in the front yeah. line. It's just, it's just like, like it's just player rotation and minutes management at this exactly. point. I mean, exactly. I also want to see something different um, in, in between the goalposts. You know, listen, they are got I that. Do. that I do. She got that start against Canada. That's your biggest CONCACAF rival. Um, so that wasn't too, I think, surprising or shocking for either of us. But I think against Japan, with the quick turnaround, you have to give another one of your goalkeepers. game. There's I three agree. goalkeepers in this She Believes Cup. There are three games. I don't know if all three of them are going to get full 90-minute matches, but I would like to see something different against Japan Yes, we've seen Casey Murphy. I need a game for Adriana France. I can see it on your lips. You want to ask what is? I need a game yeah. for Adriana France, and she Me believes, too. and I want it to be against Japan. I agree. Um, I want France. I want France to, to get a full ninety game. I do, yeah. and I also agree with you. I don't think with three goalkeepers, three games. I don't think we'll see all three of them get full games. I just don't. Um, 
I, I don't. And and I also want to see Gurma in that back line. Yeah. Give me a Gurma cook. I'll take a Gurma cook. I would I would prefer Gurma it? I would prefer Gurma Sauerbrunn, Sauerbrunn, but I think we'll get a Gurma cook. You don't you don't need there's five months to the World Cup. You don't have to evaluate Becky Sauerbrunn. We gotta see. I know. We gotta, we gotta see it and we wanna see it. So hopefully we get to see it. How about a do we want to do a prediction? Score prediction? Or do we want to put a prediction? Yes. We're already previewing it a little bit. So let's yes. maybe let's give a prediction. All right. So we've got United States on top of the standings here in She Believes Cup. Three points, also leading a goal differential over Brazil. Japan, in a similar situation with Canada, are desperate for points at this at this moment. They need to get a result. They really need to get a win. Uh, so they might present some some new and interesting things that maybe we didn't see during match day one. What do you think the uh, scoreline is going to be in this one? Who you got and why? So I love that we throw this question out here. I love everyone that joins us live. We've got score prediction, sleepy repeat three, uh, beach dogs two zero. We've got a five zero. We've got two one, two okay. one. We've got a couple two ones All in right. here. All right. Um, I am going to go. I'm going to go another two zero. I okay. am. I don't think the U.S. will run away with a game in in this type of tournament with this type of competition. Um, and depending on, like, starting lineups, I, I want to see Swanson get another goal, right? She's extended her streak to four, four straight games with a goal. Um, I want to see her get five just for the pure fact of it. I think that's so fun. But I – I could see maybe like a three nil, but I think Japan's going to be tough. I think they're going to be really tough to score against. Um, I'm going to go two zero, and I'm going to stick with that one. What about you? You know what? I think two zero is a pretty, pretty respectable scoreline. I think it could be a two goal swing. I really do. Um, I think there is going to be goalkeeper rotation in this one. I also think there's going to be some center back rotation in this one, sure. and I think that could maybe open up some interesting things for Japan if they. Uh, if they can kind of keep the ball and frustrate the United States a little bit. Um, can the U S come out with a quick star and, and get aggressive in, in their, in their counter press? Sure. Yeah. I really do believe that they can, but I think this is a Japanese team that kind of welcomes that and embraces that they want the ball. So why not try to embrace that and, and try to retain that yourself and maybe frustrate the United States a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that it's in the realm of impossibility, for Japan to perhaps capitalize on a brief uh, moment of, of lapse or error. So I'm going to keep it a two goal win for the United States, but I'm going to go three, one for the USA in this game. So you think that, well, I'm just going to put your words right back at you. If 80 French is going to start. She's going to get scored on. So I don't think it's going to be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Loopholes. I love it. It's going to be your fault. I okay. think. I think if we're going to see player rotation, that that includes. Yeah, sure. That center back duo. I think that also includes that midfield. You have to absolutely take a look at what Lindsay Horan is giving you and be cautious. If you're being cautious with Roosevelt, you got to be cautious with Lindsay Horan too. My goodness, I feel like when we've been watching this player navigate a knee knock. I know for, every for day. Lindsay part of the last 18 months. Uh, so if that means you're going to have additional rotation uh, in various positioning on the pitch, that includes the middle third. And maybe we see somebody like Andy Sullivan, not in this game. Maybe we see someone like um, Lindsay Horan, not in this game. So does that mean we see Taylor Korniak introduced back into the middle third? We'll, we'll see. You know? I, I want to see that. I do. I want to see Korniak in there alongside Sul Sullivan. I want to see both of them because what we got two minutes, in the stoppage time. Um, I want to see that start that I think that would be good. Uh, yeah. I mean, three ones, that's, that's a good score line. I, I would be still happy with that. I mean, um, I think that to be put under defensive pressure would be good for the U S I'm would. with you on that. We said we wanted yeah. that. And she believes yeah. Cup. we wanted to have the opportunity and, to and they that. didn't really get it against Canada. No, they did not. So we they want, we want that game to where we can have something to sort of sink our teeth into in terms of taking a look at defensive evaluation. So hopefully this will be the game that uh, where that gets presented. Uh, you know, we're going to recap it for you all when we get the chance. We'll make sure that we get all our flight information <laughs> correct and <laughs> travel dates, and we'll make sure that we're all good to go on that. But that's going to be it for us today 
on Attacking Third. So thank you all joining us uh, on A3. Sorry for the delay. We love linking up with you on the recap. So glad we could do this with you all this morning. Make sure that you download, follow, and listen to us anywhere you get your podcast. You can watch us too. Subscribe to us on YouTube to get alerts for whenever we go live. YouTube.com slash Attacking Third. We will be back with more United States Women's National Team content. Stay with us on a three for Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman. This was Attacking Third.